Welcome to part four of the strange case of Cabin 22. The Reckoning. Joan and Mike were shaken by a blast from their left. The ground seemed to move a bit under their feet. A hot blast of air flew right in front of her and carried bits of rock and black smoke. She fell to her knees, grabbed Mike, and held on tight, covering him. What in the hell was that? She whispered to herself. She heard rock falling and looked up to be sure they were not under some kind of rock slide. The sound was coming from her right and to her front, up the trail a bit. She held on to Mike and started yelling again, Jacob, where are you? And honestly, she was afraid to move. Dave and Rage heard a blast coming from ahead, a good bang and a slow rumble. Odd, he thought. There wouldn't be blasting here, would there? Rage barked in the direction, and Dave matter-of-factly said, I, I don't know, boy. Dave looked up to the mountainside above them, remembering the falling rock sign on his drive up, and instinctively moved to the other side of the trail. Let's go see, boy, but stay close. Rage did, and he himself felt the urgency rise inside him, as all the animals he had an extrasensory field in his bones. Lucky Dave was in the group of humans who pays attention to such things. They walked together around the turns of the path toward the direction of the loud boom they had heard. George felt the blast before he heard it. The rocks he was sliding down shook from underneath him. Then he heard it, the loud boom, coming from behind him. He stood up and did his best to see anything from that direction, but was blocked by the trees. Just a long stream of black smoke rose from the blue trail and his new friend and her son's. George moved as fast as his 70 years would allow, and his heart beat with new motion. Tate rounded the corner of the old Perkins garage where the dirt road turned to a gravel parking lot. It was filled with skeletons of old dark cars and a few older tractors, farm equipment, pieces separated, the pickups from the cars. An old tiller he used himself with his dad down on the farm and harvest echoed memories of the life he loved as a boy. His family all gone now, working at this old garage and his caretaker job at the cabin is what he had left. He was an average mechanic, not as good as Jeb or old Bob used to be, but he was all right. He liked to work on the older cars, not those new things with all the gadgets and those sensor things. Damn machines were robots, really. Not a meat and potatoes vehicle, like a 65 Mustang, or like that 1970 Challenger he got to help Jeb with last month. It was canary yellow, one with the black racing stripe. Pretty old girl she was, he said out loud to himself. He circled around the side that blocked his view of that old playground off the RV park 
That place gave him the wheelies, and he avoided it like the plague. His little revved-up golf cart crackled its wheels on the gravel as he rounded the building, and there was Jeb sitting in the same gravel, his head down in his hands and looking rougher than a raccoon gone three rounds with a mountain cat. Jeb jumped up when he heard the cart entering the lot and looked up at Tater, his hat in his hand and shielding his eyes from the sun. Jeb, you okay? Tater shouted. What you doing in the ground? Did you fall or something? Jeb rolled on his knees to begin the long climb to standing upright. Tater jumped out of the golf cart, barely coming to a stop, and he helped his friend up brushing him off as he did, his six-plus frame blocking the sun on Jeb's skinny, almost stick-figure stature. Tater fawned over him like a mother hen, and machine gun questions to him all at once. What you doing on the ground, Jeb? What, what happened to you? you? You look just awful. Are you hurt? Jeb couldn't answer. He still swayed with a weakness his hangover and his overwhelming fear. I'm, I, I'm okay, Tate. I, I just gotta get her inside. Gotta clean up. I, I gotta get inside. Tater grabbed Jeb up under one arm and bent down to grab the hat Jeb dropped while he was getting brushed off. Tater saw the puke and then he saw the side of Jeb's green Chevy. His eyes widened and he let out a scared, oh! Jeb, what happened? Oh, no. What's wrong with your truck, Jeb? Jeb stiffened a bit and added, a a a Ain't nothing, Tate. Got, to got, got too close to an old tree is all. Get me inside, will you? Tater walked his little buddy along toward the garage. Sure, sure. We got to get you cleaned up, Jeb. You smell like piss. Are, are you sure you're okay? Boom! A loud explosion from off the mountain came aloud and echoed a rumbling that sounded like that time that old factory blew up back in the 90s when he was a kid and all those people had died. Jeb stiffened up under Tater's arm and he looked in the direction of the blast. They both saw black smoke start to billow over the trees. Jeb's heart fell. Jeb knew the direction well, and he felt what was left of his strength leave his body. He bent over Tater's arm and threw up again. Mr. McGee was working on the tail feathers of a huge eagle he was carving out of a redwood stump for his wife. He had saved this piece of fine wood for something special, and this eagle was it. The chainsaw, his wife called a noisemaker, covered the sound of the blast, and the rumble under his feet was lost to his concentration. Mrs. McGee felt it, though, in her kitchen, her good china started to rattle in the china cabinet, and her spices in the rack clattered together, and she steadied herself against the counter and whispered, Oh my, what in the world? And started to yell for her husband. Charles! Charles! Greta felt it too, reached over to turn down her audio book and just listened. What, what was that? She thought out loud and she touched the walkie-talkie in her apron pocket, thought twice, said a little prayer. George, George, are you all right? Over. George, she yelled into the device now. A crackle of static, she could hear a heavy breathing, and she listened intently. Finally, yes, Greta, I am okay. Over. You're breathing, George. Are you, are you running? What happened? Over? George steadied himself a moment. Greta, I am fine, but there's, there's some sort of explosion, an explosion in the mountain. I mean, a cave maybe. 
Oh, Greta, I don't know. There was a blast, but I am fine. Over. Oh, no. Were you close to it? Over. Greta, it, it, it wasn't too far off. I'm okay. I'm okay. I need you to go to the lodge. Listen to me carefully. Go and call the sheriff. Tell them there was an explosion of some kind on the blue trail. The blue cha trail, Greta, do you hear me? Do you copy the blue trail about at a quarter way marker? Do you understand? Over. Yes, George. Yes, George, I understand. You need the sheriff. Quarter mile marker, blue trail, explosion, maybe a cave. Over. Yes, that's right, Rosebud. I am on my way down there now. Tell them come quickly. I think it was a cave, a cave-in of some kind. Greta, and tell them, I think a small boy went in there moments before. Greta, do you understand what I'm saying? Over. Greta raised her hand to her heart as if the news of a child being hurt could make it fly from her chest. Yes, George, I understand. The sheriff and an ambulance, too. Over. Yes, Greta. I need my hands now. I have to climb down. I am okay. I am going to warn the mom. I saw him go in with my binoculars. And I will call you as soon as I am down to the trail. Go now. Run, Greta. Over. Greta assured him she would. She was already out of the door of the cabin and quickly making her way to the lodge and the only landline close by. Yes, George, I am on my way. Be careful. Over. Greta. Greta. Pray. Over. I already am, George, she thought. Mrs. McGee was coming out of the office door when she saw Greta Steele running up the path toward her, waving. She ran to meet her. Are you all right, Greta? She asked as she met her friend. Greta tried to catch her breath. <sighs> Phone. Sheriff. Explosion. Oh, no. I heard it. Where? H how do you know? And saw the walkie in Greta's hand as they both started to run toward the office. George, he saw it. An explosion, he said. A small boy, he said, went in. Oh, we have to get the sheriff. Get the sheriff, she said through heavy breathing and fear. They reached the office, and Greta threw herself against the counter and leaned toward the phone, walkie-talkie in one hand, and holding her chest with the other. May McGee ran around the corner and lifted the receiver of the phone and dialed the number written on the wall in blue ink. Sheriff Cook office it read it rang twice and a friendly yet professional voice came over the line Madison County Sheriff Department Officer Nan Burnett speaking Nan Nan it's May McGee up at the cabins oh hi Mrs. McGee what's the trouble those kids again no no Nan Mrs. McGee cut her off listen I need Sheriff Cook right away there's been some kind of explosion. Explosion? Where, Mrs. McGee? Off the mountain here, off one of the big trails. Okay, Mrs. McGee. Hold on, dispatching. Unit 4, we have a code 2 and a possible 1030. Hold. Mrs. McGee, can you explain this again? Yes, a guest here at the cabins called his wife over a walkie one of those walkie-talkies, and said he saw the explosion. Where, Greta? She looked at Greta, getting her breath. About the quarter-mile way marker on the blue trail. Said he saw a small boy, possibly, that went into the cave there near the explosion. Okay. Yes, on the blue trail here, about a quarter-mile marker. Nan, he says he saw a small boy go in there. I don't know, but we need help quick, Nan. Can you send the sheriff? Okay, Mrs. McGee. I have help on the way. I will get Sheriff Cook, too. Joe Parker is on his way now. He's already got the sirens a running. Stay on the line a moment. Nan ran around her desk and opened the door to Bill Cook's office. Sheriff, there's been some kind of explosion up at McGee's place. Bill Cook 
sat up in his chair, grabbed his hat in one hand, checked his revolver on his side mindlessly, and headed out the door. Danker, let's go, he called to the deputy. Anyone hurt, Nan? May says there may have been a small boy. Went into a ca cave there, a cave of some kind, maybe, and it blew. I'm still getting information, but Joe is headed on the scene. Oh, Lord, we're going to need extra hand. Call the EMTs and get search and rescue on standby. Will do, sir. Be careful, and please let us know, she called behind them. Unit 4, she called over the radio. Sheriff and Unit 2 en route. Getting EMT behind you. 10-4, ETA, 10 minutes, Deputy Parker called back over the radio. Nan pushed the hold button. Mrs. McGee? Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, do you know if anyone else is hurt? I don't, Nan. I'm going to get Charles here, get the four-wheelers out. Is Sheriff Bill on his way? Yes, Joe is almost there. I have EMTs dispatch, search and rescue on standby. Thank you, Nan. You stay strong, Miss McGee. Call me if any if you need anything else, and, and tell Charles that too, please. Thank you, Nan. Greta and May McGee both went out to Chuck McGee, standing in a pile of redwood dust, and they told him what they knew. Is that all he said, Greta? Chuck asked. Yes, he's climbing down to where it happened, he said. Going to warn the mother. Said he saw the boy go in through binoculars? May added. Joe Parker is on his way, Nan says, and Sheriff's right behind him. Okay, May. And he kissed her forehead. It's all right. We will figure this out. I'll get the four-wheelers out for the boys. Greta, can you get George on that thing? I can try, Greta answered. George, George, come in. Over? A pause. Greta? Heavy breathing. We're almost there. Over? She handed the walkie to Charles McGee. George! Chuck here. Are you okay, my friend? Yes. Yes, it is awful, Chuck. Stop running and tell me what you know. Chuck, Joan, and the kids on the trail the, with the boys. I saw the young one got into a cave or a hollow. I don't know if that was the place that blew up. The explosion I heard. I only saw black smoke. Chuck moved from the back of the lodge toward the opening of the trees, and he saw black smoke billowing in the wind against the blue sky. Okay, George, you stay safe and let me know when you get to the trail. He walked off from the women a bit, and his voice trailed. I'll wait for Joe Parker, and we'll, we'll be right up with the side-by-sides. Are you hurt at all? No, no, just, just in a hurry, Chuck, okay? And tell them to hurry. Get up here, that poor boy. Over? We will. Over. He handed the walkie to Greta. I know where he is. I'm going to go get the wheels ready. You gals go make some coffee and stay calm and stay by the phone. It's going to be a long day. He kissed May and took off to the sheds and the 4 by 4s He could hear Joe Parker's siren in the distance coming up the mountain. Rage got to Joan and Mike first. She was so scared and distraught. Dave didn't need to get closer to tell that. Mike was yelling, Jacob! And they were looking all over. Joan startled at Rage's running up. He, he's okay, ma'am. I'm Dave, and this is Rage. Can we help? Are you hurt? The smoke, black and nasty, billowed out of the cave, and Joan ran up. No, we are okay. There was this big explosion, and my son, he's only six. He is missing. He was right here. I turned around, and now he's gone. Like one of those missing 411 David What's-His-Name things. I mean, he just disappeared, and he isn't answering me. He was right here. I, I, I understand, ma'am. Please calm down and, and sit right here. He helped her to a rock off the trail, away from the smoke. Dave calmly said, Now, take a breath and start again. 
where did you last see him? Joan explained, and Rage sniffed around and sat by Mike, who pet him without really thinking about it much. He had clear tear tracks of tears running down his dust-stained face. Joan went on, and Dave took it all in. Okay, he said, do you have something, anything of Jacob's, something that he might have worn? Yes, his hoodie, but what? Don't worry, just please give it to me if you have it. She took off her backpack, felt around inside, and pulled out a faded red hoodie in a child's small, and burst into tears again. Dave took it from her and said, Thank you. Did either of you see anyone else on the trail? Hear a dirt bike or an RV, maybe? Joan shook her head no, and looked at Mike, who did the same. Sit right here, please. He looked toward his dog. Rage? Work boy? Rage perked up and ran over to Dave, sat straight up, and looked at his friend. Dave said something in a language Joan didn't understand, and Rage jumped up into action on all fours and just breathed in the scent on the hoodie. I'm with SARS, ma'am, out of Albany, New York. Rage here is a rescue dog. It stands for search and rescue. Rage will find your boy. He couldn't have gone far. Please just sit here and we will have a look. Take care of your mom, son, and stay here so we're not looking for two lost boys, okay? He smiled at Jacob and Jacob nodded and moved close to his mom. Rage, go! Dave said and Rage sprung into action. He sniffed around the area, picked up a scent and moved through the bushes like the wind toward the smoke. <laughs> Jacob crawled into a wonder of a secret. His eyes opened wide with glee. A huge room yawned out of the opening of the tunnel. He could hear water dripping, and it echoed in front of him. He could stand up now, so he took the flashlight out of his mouth and looked around. A small slit in the ceiling shone a beam of daylight into the darkened cave. The boy looked up with the flashlight and could see bats hanging there. A few flew up and out of the opening in the ceiling, and he whispered, Cool. He followed his light's beam around the cave walls, thinking there were some wicked hiding spots for pirate treasure in here. He remembered his pirate stories very well, and he knew there would be a possible skeleton guard. A pirate killed by Blackbeard or that Long John Silvers maybe killed and left to guard the treasure for all eternity jacob said this last part out loud swishing his flashlight in front of him like a sword just then a large explosion came from the direction he had just left he let out a scream and jumped away and landed on his back rock dust came from the tunnel he had just crawled through in a blast of hot air and he covered his ears and looked up as more bats flew out of the hole above and they flew all around the cave screeching as they went the tunnel weeped out dust and what looked like smoke <gasps> a cave in he thought oh man oh man jacob looked around with his light mostly just rock and maybe what looked like two other openings in the cave walls. They were dark, but worth a look, he thought. He, he, he was getting a bit scared now. The tunnel just caved in that he crawled through, just barely missing him. He had no idea what that bang was, but he had to find a way out, and he got up to check out the other openings. <laughs> <laughs> From the other side of the cave, he heard what he thought was laughter. 
Don't be a silly baby. You have to be brave and find a way out of here, he said to himself. <laughs> he heard it again, showing his light around. Nothing. Cracks in the rocks, a dead rat, spider webs as big as cars stretched across the walls. He bent down to try and see down the tunnel he had just crawled through, and it felt like heat and dust and smoke was still coming through it. He knew he had to get out of there. Mob will be so mad, he frowned. He stood up and brushed off his knees and looked again. There was a huge puddle, a lake really. He thought the water was dark and smelled bad too. Another laugh came. From where, though? And Jacob asked himself. All, all right, I, I hear you. You come out, he warned. Who's in here? The light's beam showed on rock walls. An old dead thing, just bones, really. A squirrel, maybe? He wondered. It hung off the edge of a rock, and its bone tail dipped into the murky water. A few bats still hanging upside down from the ceiling, some flitting their wings. This all started to creep Jacob out. Like when Mike used to scare him jumping out from behind something in the basement laundry room, or telling spook stories in the dark till he wanted to cry. But he didn't. Mike would never let up if he did. He started toward what looked like his way out making his way along the wall, away from the smelly water. I see you. And then that laughter. <laughs> Jacob almost dropped his light, but steadied himself and showed it in the direction of the voice. A small girl in a white and blue dress was standing on the other side of the water in the back part of the cave. I see you, she said again. Jacob just froze and stammered out a few words. Who, who, who are you? Y you scared me. I am Coralie. Do you want to play with me? Jacob was shocked. Um, uh, not now. I, I'm, I'm looking for treasure and another way out of here. Jacob said, puffing out his chest a bit, and remembered. I followed that rabbit in here. He showed the light around with no sign of the rabbit, and she laughed again. <laughs> I don't see any rabbit, silly baby. The boy thought for a moment. Had I said that out loud? Shaking it off quick, he thought, Do you know if there's pirate treasure here? Jacob blurted out, not really thinking at all. She said, Mayhap I do, but I'm not telling. And she leaned towards him almost over the edge of the dark water and said, Unless you play a game with me first. Jacob thought and stuck out his chin. Oh, heck, I don't have time for no games. Then I'm not telling, and crossed her arms. Jacob thought again. Oh, oh okay, well, do you know which of these tunnels takes us out of here? That one there is all smoky. He pointed the way he came. Sure, I play here all the time. If I show you... Will you come to the playground and meet my friends? Wanting this to be so over, the scared six-year-old said, Oh, sure, I guess, just, just tell me. You have to promise, cross your heart, and hope to die. Jacob rolled his eyes and reluctant, reluctantly did so. This was so stupid, he thought. And Coralie quick screwed up her face and said, That's not very nice. As if she heard him, 
and then she laughed. <laughs> This scared Jacob even more, and he was officially no longer having fun. Coralie made her way around the cave's pool and sang as she did. It was creepy, he thought, and he made small talk as she did to try to push away the feeling. Hey, hey, well, wh where? His voice stuck and he <clears throat> swallowed and tried again. Wh where is this playground? He managed. Just outside. It's our playground. Mine and all my friends, she said and laughed the creepy little laugh. <laughs> He almost thought dumb girls and stopped himself and she looked at him and squinted in the flashlight beam he quick tried thinking of something else hey uh hey be careful you don't slip there he called to her she smiled a bit of a smile i won't i'm here quite a lot and giggled where where, where are your friends now Jacob was getting a bit worried. He wanted out of this place. They are waiting for us on the playground. And Jacob just shivered. Rage ran right to the side of the explosion. Smoke wafted from above him, easing a bit up now. What you got, boy? Rage was digging at the fallen rocks. Dirt flew behind him, and Dave ran up and talked to the dog as if he were a partner and not a dog at all. Okay, Rage, is he there? The dog dug. Dave started pulling rocks. He noticed there was a plywood door covered in vines, burnt and hanging, and this seemed odd to him. He didn't know what it meant, but he didn't like it. He heard a yell. Joe! familiar voice it was George out of breath and running around the corner Dave stood up and went toward the trail Dave oh thank God listen to me Joan joined them with Mike hanging on to her arm still scared and watching intently Dave Joan I was on the hill bird watching and he pointed and dropped his heavy pack breathless he got the words out I saw through my binoculars Jacob went in this way he pointed going by the landscaping he saw from above and then noticed the smoke coming from where he saw Jacob disappear. His hope fell, and he added, I tried to call down, but you didn't hear me. Dave said, Come with me. They all ran toward the cave-in. Stay back, Joan. Be careful here. She held herself together, worried, yes, but kept her grounding for Mike. Rage was digging like mad. Help me with this, George, Dave asked as they moved the rocks they could. Rage is on Jacob's scent. He hasn't laid down, George, Dave whispered to him. George asked Dave as they rolled the debris, and Dave told George he is a search and rescue dog. He has worked many fires, and we were in Key West. Our group went down there to help. If Jacob was gone... He turned around and whispered this part so he wouldn't let Joan overhear. Rage would lay down. I see. I called down to Greta on the walkie. Sheriff is on his way, and he's bringing help. Oh, that's great, George. I didn't think I could get Joan to go down for help. That's good news. Okay, help me with this big one. They both pulled on a large rock, and George looked to his side to find a branch to maybe help pry it. Dave pulled himself up and put his back against the rubble and pushed with his feet, and the rock gave way. Look out, Rage! Rage moved back and then started digging, and he was making progress and could reach up to his shoulders now. Dave and George did their best to move the rocks away for the dog. Dave heard Rage bark and heard a bit of an echo. 
Rage was through. Rage stopped, pulled out of the hole he had made, his nose covered in red clay and soot. Woo! Okay, Rage, you got his trail. Dave asked and reached for the hoodie and put it under his nose. Okay, buddy, you go. And Rage disappeared into the hole. Joan covered her mouth to stifle a cry, and Mike squeezed her arm. <laughs> Jacob watched the girl with his light as she stepped into his side of the cave pond. She looked pale and sick, he thought, like that kid in his class who was always missing school. I can show you now. Follow me. But don't you forget your promise. This way, come on. And she led him down the tunnel to the right. He showed his flashlight beam ahead and it was large enough to stand up in. Coralie walked ahead of him like she knew the tunnel by heart, and she ran her fingers along the wall as she did. It made him feel all goosebumpy, and he tried to find things to say. How long is this tunnel? Does it go all the way out? Oh, it's not far. You will see the light in a bit around the turn. And she giggled again and sang that creepy song of hers. It gave Jacob the willies, and he tried to think of things to say to break away from the fear. Do you, do you go to school around here? Is that where the playground is? He managed to push out the words. Oh, no, she answered. I don't go to school. I got sick. And my ma didn't make me go anymore. She giggled as she spoke. And Jacob was running out of things to talk about. And looked back down the tunnel they had just come back from. And where they had entered was much further away than he had thought. The tunnel's walls seemed to blur and move in and out like a fun house hallway. It looked like the walls were breathing. And he felt fuzzy, and it felt hard to breathe in here. Scared, he asked more questions. How, how much further is it anyway? This seems so far. Coralie giggled. Oh, it's not far up ahead here. Quit being squirrely. He turned back around, and his flashlight beam lit up the wall of the tunnel she was running her hand along. And then he realized... The light beam, it went right through Coralie. Dave heard Rage bark once and felt like he was more to the right of the cave's entrance than further back. He touched that part of the rock and yelled, Go get him, boy! And Joan sat down on the ground, put her head in her hands, and cried. Dave and George pulled at the rocks they could move, and they heard a motor coming up the trail. Jeff ran into the garage, into the room his cot was in, grabbed some jeans on a chair and picked up a t-shirt. Tater was asking him what he thought that explosion was, and Jeb was in no mood to answer questions. He quickly changed his shirt and wriggled into his jeans. Tater was what they called slow, and he usually had patience with him. He loved the old cars and worked hard. 
but there was no way he could bring him in on the secret of his daddy's deal. We are just going to go have a look-see. Is there gas in that go-kart of yours? Sure is. Filled it up this morning. Okay, you're going to drive me somewhere, and you ain't going to ask me no more questions right now, okay? My truck won't get far into those trails. Well, okay, Jeb. Tater answered and watched Jeb grab a set of keys off the board, and he followed him out to the golf cart. Jeb saw some black rags hanging out of the little cart storage trunk and yelled at Tater, I told you, don't have them greasy rags laying around, Tate. They can cause a fire quick. Daddy never liked them laying around. Tater quick lifted the trunk, a scared look on his face. He hated when Jeb yelled. Okay, I'll take care of them, Jeb. I promise, Jeb. He jumped in the old golf cart. Now let's go fast, Tate. Step on it. Where are we a going again, Jeb? Tater asked as he turned the key. Get me to the blue trail, Tate, and hurry. Chuck McGee rode these trails all the time and knew right where Greta had met. Deputy Joe Parker hung on the bar on the side-by-side four-wheeler like his life depended on it. Chuck bounced and laughed a bit, and Joe grabbed his hat and the shovels and picks in the back rattle. There were two more of these little scooters, Chuck called them, back with May and Greta all gassed up and waiting on the sheriff. Dave did his best to fit in the hole Rage dug, and he had pulled a few more rock from the opening, but couldn't fit all the way in. Chuck McGee pulled up the trail and jumped out with the deputy. George stood up and filled them in, and Deputy Parker would take down all the statements officially later. There was a kid possibly hurt here, and that took precedence. The deputy called into Sheriff Cook. It looks bad, Sheriff. Something blew up in here for sure. An old cave looks like. All well caved in. A child, age six, seen by a witness to possibly be in there. Right before the blast, oh, no further word. Oh, Lord, is all Deputy Joe could make out coming back over the walkie. Chuck got two picks and shovels out of the little four by four, and they all started working on the rocks. Dave told Chuck and Joe about Rage, and they were all grateful they had a trained search dog on duty already. Dave worried for his friend, but knew if he had a scent, Rage wouldn't stop till he reached his source. It was what he was trained to do, after all. After Irma, when his Albany unit was sent to help in Key West, he lost sight of Rage for half a day in the rubble of a hotel there. When Dave and the rescue volunteers finally broke through the debris. He found Rage laying next to a woman that was pinned by a support wall, and Rage had sat with her for hours, letting out barks to keep those digging on course. Two more motors were heard speeding up the trail, and the men kept at it, loosening rock and waving smoke away as they broke through. Sheriff Bill Cook got out of the side-by-side and made his way toward the commotion. Joan and George filled him in, with add-ons from Deputy Joe. Brother, grab a couple of those shovels out in the, in the four-wheeler. Let's get this open. Everyone not ding it. Please stay back. Let them work. We don't need anyone else. Um, he stopped and looked at little Mike's tear-stained face and changed his words. Anyone else lost up here? Damn it, McGee. What do you think? Kids pulling something up here in these caves? Has to be something on fire in there, all this black smoke. The smoke was definitely backing down, but still drifting through the rock spaces. I don't know, Bill. Hadn't seen anything up here in a while. Just people fishing and the like. Well, if this boy is in here, we're going to find out. Any chance there's another entrance? Is this one of the caves on your map, Chuck? Mickey said, I, I have never seen this one. And the college and the nature society that mapped those out never had this one on the map either. Dave heard a distant bark, meaning Rage was still on the case. 
Chuck introduced Dave to Bill as the others moved back. Bubba cleared enough space to start to swing a pick and get a better hold of a big rock there. Sheriff reached out his hand to Dave. Good to have you aboard, son. Sorry to meet under these circumstances. Dave shook the big man's hand and said, Same here. Didn't plan on reporting to work this soon, but glad to be of, a, of any help I can. Well, we're damn glad. Damn glad to have you. Search and rescue will be coming out of Huntsville. Nan has a bet on them being at least 20 to 30 minutes out still. Good, good, Chuck said and added, At this rate, we might just get in there before then. Bubba yelled, Look out! And the rock gave way. Dust flew up and out of the cave opening. Joe turned on the beam of the heavy flashlight he had, and so did the sheriff, and light beamed through the smoke and down into the tunnel that opened into the side of the mountain. Joe coughed at the smoke and waved his hand and pushed forward. Got two more flashlights out of the four-wheeler and handed one to Dave. Dave moved rock from the bottom right of the cave and found a small tunnel off to one side. He showed the light into it and called out, Rage! He waited, and a far-off answer came back. Woof! And Dave smiled. was wishing he had a faster vehicle and repeatedly told Tater to step on it, will you? But the old golf cart Tater used to putz around the cabin's grounds was doing its very best. Jeb didn't know what had happened, but the direction the smoke was coming from worried him. He couldn't see the smoke now, but he just had to get a better look. Jeb touched the set of keys in his pocket now and thought to himself, Skeet said he packed that other truck and left it in the hiding spot on the east tunnel entrance. If there was anything up, he could get it, and the shine packed in it to the buyer. Man, Skeet, what'd you do, man? What'd you do? His heart sank even further, as he knew the blast would have brought even more people than him and Tate toward the place he had kept secret all his life. Step on it, Tater, please! He said, a bit more pleading this time. Bubba, get that spotlight up here and grab that extinguisher too. There's some light ahead, Sheriff Bill called back. The men pushed forward. Joe yelled out for Jacob with no response. Dave was up front with Joe now, and he could see a slight flicker of fire behind them. Sheriff Cook, Chuck, then Bubba, last in line, and his six-foot-three frame was having the hardest time of this part of the tunnel. George waited with Mike and Joan at the entrance, hoping the little crew would find Jacob and find him alive. Dave knew Rage would be trying to find him, too. Maybe this led to where they were. The tunnel got lower, and the men had to hunch down more. And Joe pushed through and hollered back, Sheriff! Sure. There's a cave in here. Bubba, pass up that extinguisher and some more lights. Jacob swallowed hard. That's not real, he thought. He ran the flashlight beam down to her legs and saw it went right through them. He held on to his fear and thought of the rabbit, just the rabbit, or anything but what he just saw. He was not a silly baby, he thought. 
he knew she could hear his thinking. And he had been in, in, in many a book before. He tried to remember the story, to think of anything but the light that was going through Coralie. How, how, how far now, Cor Coralie? She laughed. <laughs> and he thought of just running, of just running back or forward, of any way but staying here. He was scared now, officially scared and wished he had never seen this old cave. Coralie pointed ahead at a sliver of light that showed ahead. The dust of the cave danced in the beams of light. Jacob's heart lifted a bit. A way out! The whisper excited him, but as light as wind within his own head. He was scared to blurt out words now. He was so so close. Follow me, Coralie started to skip now. Come with me, Jacob. Jacob was startled. He had never said his name. Not once has he said his name. He followed as long as he was headed out of this mess. He could, She could call him anything, he thought. The tunnel made a turn, and there was sunlight, beautiful, beautiful sunlight merged in front of him and Coralie. It almost blinded Jacob and he blinked his eyes. Coralie stopped in front of him and pointed. See, I told you, silly baby. As she turned around and Jacob gasped and drew in the stale air, Coralie's face had changed. Changed into a bony gray mask, just like the skull on the pirate's flag. He was stunned and dropped the flashlight at his feet. Coralie, or the thing she had become, giggled and leaned into his own face. Breath that smelled like his hamster cage and Mike's old sneakers took over his nostrils and he wanted to puke. He fell back against the cave wall and glanced over her shoulder to make a run for the exit back into the real world. There, standing in the opening of the cave, with six or seven other children. They were shadowed figures backed by the clean, bright daylight of the sun. One, a little girl, held a stuffed teddy bear, and she was dressed in rags. Half her face was missing. A taller boy stood with blood running out of his mouth that hung open in a silent scream and his arm hung at his side, ripped open to the bone. Two boys stood with him, their hands clasped together with angry faces. The gaping wounds across both of their throats oozed blood down the front of their white shirts and little narrow black ties and matched the red of their school uniforms. A bigger boy stood behind them, his head hung to one side, and it swayed back and forth and looked at Jacob with bulging eyes. An older girl, dressed in overhauls and high-top sneakers, stood by him. Her smile framed in the blood that ran from her head wound and soaked her long, blonde pigtails to a tomato red. Coralie spoke and Jacob's eyes focused back on her. Remember your promise, little rabbit. Your promise to stay and to play with us. You crossed your heart and hoped to die. And she giggled, and the foul air from her breath made Jacob want to puke again. He was pushed up against the cave wall and was begging his feet to move, for his legs to run, but he was frozen, frozen stiff. He closed his eyes and turned away from her stench, and she took one bony hand and grabbed him by the chin, turned his face to look at her, and pinned him with the other hand on his shoulder. Come and play with us, Jacob, he heard from the others behind her in the opening of the cave. Come and play!
If he could only run, make his legs move. He felt a long, warm stream of pee run down his leg, and Coralie laughed, opened her mouth, and drew in a deep breath close to his mouth. He thought she was going to kiss him, but she just breathed in deep, and Jacob could feel his knees weaken, and his head got fuzzy again. Come and play with us, Jacob. He could hear them chanting, and he thought it couldn't be that bad. Wouldn't be that bad. His thoughts giving in to Coralie's breath and seemed to follow the air she sucked from him. From him, he thought, and he could feel his legs no more. Bubba passed up the extinguisher to Chuck, Chuck to Dave, and Dave to Joe. Joe pulled the pin and aimed the spray forward and walked in as he did, now giving off little bursts of the foam. Dave walked behind him and saw small groups of flames and flickers of the orange light played on the gray walls. They both stopped there. Well, Joe stopped abruptly, and Dave ran into the back of him. Joe held up one hand in a stop motion as if he was the forward observer in the jungles of Vietnam. He stood and looked around a moment and whispered, Holy fuck! The last of the word lost in the beginning of a whistle, low and solemn. As Joe reached up and took off his hat, and in a low voice let these words ease low from his mouth. Sheriff, we have a situation in here. Dave looked over Joe's shoulder with his spotlight's beam in the small clearings of smoke that were dancing in the room. He could see what looked like centerfolds. They were plastered like wallpaper on one wall. The nude's bodies curled and burnt upwards and still smoldering. One day forgot her name had bl blood splattered and jellied chunks sliding down her skin as a black ribbon of burnt edge creeped ever closer upward. Some looked untouched and smiling at what they too were seeing here. Oh my God, whispered Dave as he moved around the part of the room he could see with the light. Joe was taking careful steps forward and calling back one-word descriptions. Deceased, individual, male, middle-aged, I think, came words slow and deliberate, Joe's voice only shaking enough for Dave to pick up. But Dave understood. Sheriff called up toward the front of this line and asked, What's that? Repeat, deputy? Chuck looked back toward the sheriff. Dead, middle-aged, says it's hard to tell. What about the boy? You see any sign of the boy? Sheriff Bill called up. Hold on, it's hard to see. There's stuff all over the floor here, sheriff. Joe took two steps forward, and Dave could move into the cave a bit more. Dave shined his light downward. There was blood everywhere, glass and metal parts singed and strewn throughout. He could see what looked like a body laying in the debris. A man, most likely, or used to be anyway, Dave thought. Maybe in overhauls? Burnt patches in the denim opened to holes deep in the skin of the man, like the jeans had melted into this man and became part of him. One leg Dave could see as a slight wind moved the smoke, had blown back broken and rested across what used to be this man's chest. Joe's light beam played against the wall and made the dust and smoke look like it was dancing in the mayhem of the scene and Dave caught what looked like an eyeball, complete with its optic nerves and stringing goo attached to the breast of a centerfold, 
with a piece of copper tubing, it looked like. Joe winced and turned his light to the left. The smoke seemed to be pulled away down another exit or tunnel. Joe called back. Looks like another exit in here, boss, and took another step. A line of men all moved with him, like a macabre dance line in a bar's closing hour bunny hop each man peeking over the guy in front and catching glimpses of a scene out of a Stephen King movie. Bubba asked the sheriff if he wanted him to call it in yet. Let's wait and see what we have first, son. Let's find a boy if we can. And they waited as Joe, the forward observer in this squad, moved his feet carefully through the muck on the floor. Joe's light picked up what he thought used to be a still, mangled and smoldering, with little patches of fire still burning the fuel below. Joe hit them with quick bursts of the extinguisher. Sheriff, we have what I think was a still. I knew it, Chuck exclaimed and patted Dave on the back of the shoulder. Sheriff reached up and pulled off his hat and said, Damn it! nodded his head and patted Chuck's shoulder as if to say make sense and tossed a look backwards toward Bubba who looked down at the sheriff still hunched in the tunnel and he nodded too all them looking like they all agreed with the final pick of a letter on the wheel of fortune game a few more steps in sheriff hold on a second Joe called back and Dave shone his light at the deputy's feet Look out, he whispered loudly to the back of Joe's head. Joe looked down and saw a pile of mangled and twisted goo. Maybe a pile of rats on the floor? Joe almost stepped in it. Thanks, Joe whispered back and shuddered. Still blue for sure, Sheriff. No sign of the boy yet. Joe cleared two more steps and Dave and Chuck were in. The Sheriff behind them was now getting a look and the first thing he saw on the wall was the eyeball slowly sliding down the stomach of Fair Fawcett. Oh my God, he whispered. Bubba could stand up now and showed his mag light in. Beams of light moved all around the cave room, each revealing a new and more grotesque scene like an old eight millimeter movie playing a massacre of the dead and dying. Is he dead, Joe? Sheriff called over to Joe, who was blocking his view of the man who was bent backwards over a crate table, it looked like, through the smoke. Joe showed his light on the man's face, or what used to be his face. His head was gone from the nose up. Red jellied goo poured from the opening where his skull used to be. Oh, he's dead, Sheriff, Joe gulped and handed back the extinguisher to Dave, who passed it to Bubba. Each man walked gingerly through the room, careful not to step in or on anything, as the Sheriff said to do just that. This here's a crime scene, gentlemen. Watch where you step, don't touch anything, and look for signs of that boy. See if you can get any ID off this poor sap, he added toward Joe, who was now the closest to what used to be Skeet. And nobody yell out. We don't know how sturdy it is in here now. Chuck was looking all around the floor with his mag light aimed at what looked like ball bearings, gleaming red and surrounded by glistening broken glass and twisted metal in his beam. Mason jars stacked and broken among what looked like smoldering magazines and piles smoked on the floor. Dave really felt for Joe and tried to help him see by aiming his light where Joe was looking on the body. Joe reached in his pocket and took out rubber gloves and placed a hand in each one. Took out a pen light and placed it in his mouth and handed Dave his spotlight. He gripped what he thought were pockets and reached the plastic of the gloves, slipping it into the space soaked with blood. He looked up at Dave and shook his head. Nothing. 
He reached under the misshapen leg across Skeet's chest and down into the side pocket. There located something and pulled it out. A gold pocket watch. He looked up at the sheriff who was standing behind him now. And the sheriff produced a Ziploc bag from his pocket and Joe dropped it in. The pocket was empty now and Joe felt around the back, reached in a back pocket and pulled out a wallet. Found his billfold, Sheriff, Joe announced. The deputy carefully opened it and looked for an ID. There was one, tucked where money would be if Skeet had any. Pulled out the plastic card and wiped the blood off its surface. A smiling picture of Skeet emerged, black hair stringing off his face with two teeth missing right up front. Oswald Malcolm Davis, Joe read aloud. Skeeter Davis, that no account. I scared him off these trails more than once. Chuck called back. Figures he'd be up here making shine. Hung with that old Jeb Perkins. He's probably in on it, too. Filed his daddy's old deeds, I'll bet. Sheriff Parker pulled out another plastic bag and opened it for Joe, and Joe dropped it in the wallet. Bubba saw a pile of crates and mismatched cushions along the back wall. Carefully moved a seat cushion that looked like one his granny had had on her sun porch. Except this one had two fingers sliding down the faded flowers like they were trying to pick the blooms for a bouquet. No sign of the boy here, Sheriff, Bubba gulped. He could feel the biscuits and gravy he had for breakfast, trying to make a hasty escape. Dave thought out loud, I wonder where that other tunnel leads to, and shone a light in that direction. Chuck said he didn't know, curious he added his light to Dave's, and they both caught a glimpse of another poster of a blonde girl with a bloody ear slowly making its way down her naked thigh, leaving a trail of blood in its wake. The ear let go and plopped onto the floor. Immediately, a huge rat with one ear half missing darted from behind a metal shelving picked up the ear in his mouth and ran down the tunnel into the darkness there. Dave looked at Chuck and almost wanted to laugh if it wasn't so damn wrong. Chuck made an oh well face and shrugged. Sheriff Cook took off his hat, wiped at his forehead and shook the watch and the wallet zip ba ziploc bags in his hand. Joe, leave the rest to the M.E. now. We got an I.D., Bubba, you go back out and call this in. Tell him it was a still explosion. Fire's out. One adult male. DOA. Make sure that woman knows there's no sign of the boy in here, and we are going to continue the search in through here. And tell Nan to bring in search and rescue team. Joe, you come with me, and let's see if this tunnel goes anywhere. Bring all the lights, fellas. Bubba was darn glad to leave and made his way back out the tunnel and did as he was instructed. Joan, George, and Mike jumped up as he exited the tunnel and he filled them in as best he could. The rest of the men left the gruesome scene behind them as they made their way down the dark tunnel out the back of the cave. Dave whispered out, Jacob, rage? Tater took the last turn onto the blue trail, and Jeb's stomach was jumping with each bump. He knew he would chuck again if there was anything left in his stomach to do so. They made the turn and saw four wheelers parked along the trail, and a huge deputy standing by one of them. Turn around, Tate! Go the other way! Right then, Jeb knew. He knew. He knew he had lost his daddy still. He had not taken care of business. 
He knew if his daddy was there, he'd have beat him plumb to death. He could hear his father laughing in his head, and it made him shudder to the bones. was frozen in the grip of Coralie. He could hear the other children still outside the tunnel chanting, Come play with us. Come play with us, Jake. Come play with us. Over and over, like it was a song. Jacob felt lightheaded and almost dreamy with fear all around the edges and he was doing his own chanting inside his head. Run, run, run. But his feet would not move. Coralie reached in to take another deep breath and Jacob tried not to look. He squinted his eyes tight and begged his feet to move. He felt the air almost pull from him like she was sucking the life right out of his body. Jacob reached down deep in his little mind and drew out a prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before... Coralie drew back and let out a hiss. And Jacob's eyes flew open, and he saw her look away from him. She still had him by one shoulder, but he could feel the ground beneath his feet again. Coralie was looking down the tunnel, and Jacob heard a blood-curdling growl. Jacob go, and he dropped to the ground, landing on his knees. He was staring down the dark tunnel he had walked up with Coralie. He crawled backwards till he hit the tunnel wall and looked up at Coralie, who was hissing at the darkness of the tunnel. Jacob was stunned and doing his best to get up and run, his legs not quite back enough to do so. He heard another growl come from the darkness and watched as Coralie stepped backwards. Just then, a dark shape emerged from the shadows. A huge black dog baring its teeth and moving forward with deliberate steps. The dog broke into a growling, barking mix that lit up the tunnel with echoing chaos and broke into a run straight for Coralie. Coralie retracted backwards, holding up her hands and added her own scream to the echoing turbulence. The dog landed on Coralie and had men fall backwards. She simply disappeared. Without seeming to notice, the black dog picked up its stride and began to growl again towards the opening in the cave. Jacob turned his head to see, and the damaged children were raising their hands to protect themselves and let out screams of their own. The dog broke into a run and Jacob watched as each kid faded into nothingness before his very eyes. Jacob brought his little hands to his mouth and screamed in them. The dog stopped his running, more like trotted over now to where the children were and sniffed the ground there wagged his tail and turned back toward Jacob who was one complete shiver at this point shaking to his very shoes his mind was whirling at what he had just saw and he was so so scared he wanted his mom for sure and he had no idea where he was the large black dog looked at Jacob tipped his head to one side and slowly walked toward Jacob. 
Little Jacob pushed himself against the wall, whispering, No, no, no more, please, no more. And Rage walked slowly up to him, bowed his head a bit, and sniffed the air around Jacob. And his tail began to wag. And he gently nudged Jacob's leg with his nose and sat down in front of him. Jacob, realizing this dog had just saved him, whispered, Thank you. Rage sat up and leaned in. Jacob winced back a little, and Rage licked his face, reached down, and took a hold of Jacob's pants leg and pulled gently. Jacob came back just a little bit then. This was a good guy dog, he thought. When Jacob pulled himself up and steadied himself with one hand on the tunnel wall, and Rage reached in and pulled his pant leg again, walking backwards toward the tunnel exit. Okay, boy, I can follow you. I'll follow you. Rage moved right next to Jacob, and together they walked toward the daylight. Dave walked with Joe, Chuck, and Sheriff Cook down the dark tunnel, and they came across large box fans hooked up to car batteries along the way. One right by the cave exit had blown over its back mashed in, but the fan kept going and scraping its sides of the casing in a screeching sound, and Joe reached down and yanked the wires off the battery, and it died with a thankful urgh. They had quite the setup, didn't they? Sheriff Cook said. Sure did, Joe answered. Probably been running shine out of here for years, Chuck added. Sure doesn't look good for us, does it, Parker? No, sir. It sure doesn't. This had to open up soon if they were running an exhaust system here, Dave added. Rage went in, trailing that boy up at the entrance at the main opening. And this feels like it's moving away from that. This could lead anywhere, boys. Some of these tunnels go on for miles out here, Chuck noted. They turned the corner as Dave finished, and up ahead was a wash of daylight through tangled vines of kudzu. The men moved quickly towards it. They could see the light streaming through. And Sheriff nodded towards Joe, and Joe proceeded kicking out the entrance and the men pulled at the vines until they were outside. Dave stepped out of the hole and looked around. They were off the side of the mountain, just barely on the edge of a cliff, and he looked down at a drop-off leading into the thick trees below. Clever some bitches, Sheriff Bill said. Let's go back, boys. End of the line. Jeb told Tater to take him around the other side of the trails toward the thick woods, and Tate knew. He'd get that truck and sneak out at dark and never come back here. He knew that old sheriff would get him this time. He was still mad he didn't get him for boosted cars back a couple years ago. Caused me all kinds of worry, he said out loud. What, Jeb? You okay? Tate asked. Just drive, Tate. Dave, Chuck, Sheriff Cook, and Deputy Parker emerged from the cave opening. George, Joan, and Mike were sitting in one of the four-wheelers, and Bubba was talking to them. Joan saw the men and jumped up hopefully. And Sheriff Cook shook his head, and she sat back down and started to cry. 
Dave said, let me check that tunnel again. And he and Joe went back to the cave's mouth. And Dave shone a light and yelled, Rage! Rage! And he waited. Nothing. He knew not to give up hope. Search and rescue would be here soon. But he had no idea where this tunnel ended up. I just don't know, Deputy. I know these things can go on for days. What is he, six years old? That's what I was told, Joe said and hung his head a bit. Dave stood in the clearing between the cave and the trail where the four-wheelers were parked. Threw his head back and looked around the top of the rocks the cave was hidden in. Scanned the trees and looked toward the sky. Rage! He let out a yell that echoed off the rocks and he felt spent and worried now. Joe walked up and put a hand on his shoulder. You did what you could, man. You did what you could. Woo! Dave swung around and looked up, shielded his eyes from the glare of the sun. Off to the right, through the trees above them, came another. Woo! Rage! Dave yelled and ran in that direction. He got a better hold on where the bark was coming from and looked above them toward a rocky ridge, and stepping into view was a beautiful black dog with a little boy holding onto his collar and sucking his thumb. Tater pulled over where Jeb had pointed. Okay, Tate, I need you to go right back to that garage. Talk to nobody, do you hear? We were never up here. Tate nodded, and Jeb slapped Tate's hat and knocked it down over his eyes. I need you to focus, Tate. Do you understand? Tate straightened his hat back. Yes, Jeb, I understand. Talk to no one. We was never up here. Jeb smiled a bit. That's right. I need you to stay down the shop and finish that John Deere for old Hampton. Parts are on my bench. It's an easy fix. You can do it. You got me? Jeb raised a hand and Tater flinched and put up his hand. I got you. Clear, Jeb. Finish Hampton's tractor. Tate frowned. Are you okay, Jeb? Tate was worried for his friend. Jeb wasn't much of one, but he didn't have many. Not since old Bob died. Jeb revved up now, pulled himself out of the golf cart. Don't you worry on me, Tate. Just do as I say. Anyone asks I'm sick in the cot and taking no calls or new work today. All right? Jeb leaned in the cart with one arm over its hood looked long and hard at Tater. I mean what I say. We were never up here. I'm counting on you. Take care of business. Tater, I'll be back late tonight and we'll go in town. Get us a pizza and a six, okay? Tater smiled and fixed his hat straight again. Okay, Jeb. I will. Not too late, Jeb. That place scares me after dark. Okay, Jeb? Jeb agreed. Not too late, Tate. Slapped the hood of the golf cart and added, Go on now. Straight back, Tater. Tater pulled off and left Jeb in what looked like the middle of nowhere. Jeb watched him till he couldn't see him no more and then looked up toward the cliff. A small stream of smoke lofted out of the opening toward the tunnel above and Jeb stepped backwards deeper into the tree line and watched wondering how bad it really was. You know that good-for-nothing, worthless friend of yours, and blue old Sally. He wasn't taking care of business, and it's on you, you little shit. His father's voice came through loud and clear in Jeb's head. 
He crunched down further into the thicket of the wood line and looked upwards again at the back tunnel that came off the stills cave. Smoke that black had to be serious. Sally was gone, all right. Jeb reached up and took off his hat and held it to his chest. Oh, Sally, he said, almost tears in his voice. I should have never left you with old Skeet. It's all my fault. Just then he saw movement on the cliff by the tunnel's opening. Looked like somebody was kicking, kicking a covering down from the inside. Jeb huddled backwards again and pulled a leafy branch around in front and watched intently as Deputy looked like that Deputy Parker and some tall guy he'd never seen pushed out of the tunnel and stood there looking around. Oh, no. There came Chuck McGee and there's old Sheriff Bill Cook in his tan uniform and his big old cowboy hat. Jeb didn't move. He knew it was over now. He is done for. Sally's gone. Skeet probably in cuffs somewhere by now. And all his girls he'd never see again. The cases of shine lost. Oh, Sally. Oh, Sally. Jeb wanted to cry. Don't you flinch, you sissy boy. Don't you do it. I won't, Daddy. Jeb said this part out loud, squeezing and twisting his hat in his hand so hard he'd like to rip it in half. Dave called and his friend barked back. Pride and relief welled up in Dave so fast he could hardly believe it all himself. My God, Joe whispered and put a hand on Dave's shoulder. My God in heaven, look at that. Deputy Parker burst with happiness and yelled out, Hey, Sheriff, look! Everyone turned to see what Deputy Parker was pointing at, and there on the rock ridge they all saw it big black dog with a very dirty little boy who was sucking his thumb. Jacob! screamed Joan, and she jumped out of the four-wheeler so fast she almost fell, and Bubba caught her with one big arm and almost hugged her as she as he did. We will go get him, ma'am. You stay here. You'll get hurt climbing up there. Mike yelled too. Jacob! He was truly grateful to see his little brother that he burst into tears. Chuck looked up and said as he took his hat from his head and held it to his chest, Sweet Jesus in the morning, look a there. Well, I'll be dipped and fried, Sheriff Cook smiled. That's one hell of a dog you got there, son. And he whacked Dave on the back as he gladly gave out orders for his deputies to get up there and bring that boy down to his mama. With a huge smile, he added, Bubba, you call down to Nan and tell her to call off search and rescue. I'll be dipped, he added, and smacked Chuck on the back now. <laughs> Dave yelled up to Rage to hold and gave him the hand signal to boot, and Rage woofed and sat down next to the boy, whose grip right now was so tight on Rage's collar he couldn't feel his fingers anymore. He saw the people down below, but he just stood there, not saying a word. He just stood there, and right now, to Jacob, standing was good enough. Jeb waited till the intruders went back in the tunnel before he made a move. I gotta get that truck out of here, that Skeet loaded. I'll wait till dark and roll her halfway down the road before I even turn her on. Be police moving all over here most of the day, I reckon. I'll just wait them out. Jeb pushed through the brush and felt a sigh of relief when he caught a glimpse of the camouflage-covered truck right where he had told Skeet to keep it. 
least you got that right, he said out loud to no one. He moved around the back and lifted the camo nettings cover over the side of the truck bed. He could see the cases of shine lined up in their cases and like dollar signs formed clear in his mind. Good man, Skeet, he thought quick and covered her back up, patted the truck and ran around to the driver's side door, took out the keys and unlocked her. This was his old 1075 Silverado. A beauty she was, original blue paint with white panels running down her sides. 454 big block she was, purred like a bobcat. She'll get me where I need to be, he thought. I got a few hours to kill till dark, he said to himself. He leaned across the seat, popped the button to the glove box, and rattled his hand around inside. Oh, hell yes! He pulled out a sleeve of saltines and a can of Vienna sausages and took out his old pocket knife and eased back in the seat, satisfied for the first time today. He leaned down on the floor, the passenger side, and looked at a half a case of mason jars. Why not? Jeb smiled and reached for a jar. A little of the hair dog to bitch you. And he laughed and he choked on the bit of cracker in memory. He sat up straight and remembered the dog thing that clawed his old Chevy almost got him the night before. It wasn't far from here, he thought. And suddenly Jeb wasn't as comfortable staying out here till dark. He reached over and pushed down the lock on the door and slid down the seat, opened the jar and started a drink for different reasons now. From the thickness of the woods, something big breathed in deeply and a set of green and hungry eyes focused on a human scent not far up the wind and a low growl formed in its throat and it too waited for nightfall. <coughs> You have been listening to Part 4 of The Strange Case of Cabin 22, The Reckoning, an original story by Cisco Murdoch. What waits for Jeb in the woods of this mysterious mountain? Will Jacob recover from his run-in with the ghost of the damaged children from the cave? What has been stalking campers and haunting Dave and Rage in Cabin 22. Tune in to Part 5. We sure do hope that you're enjoying this story. Please catch the prequel, The Cabin, Parts 1, 2, and 3. Let's get caught up for Halloween for the finish. I'd like to thank all of the sub subscribers and hit that notification button so you don't miss Part 5 part six and the finale of this original haunting novella i would love to thank everybody who has subscribed and hit the like button if you can and what we're trying to do is get more subs for the finale and we might just have a little uh combined event with steve stockton and his channel 13 past midnight for the new for the reveal of the final chapter so thank you so much dear listeners thank you for all the kind comments and uh it's been great doing this and that i'm hoping that you're going to really enjoy the finale of this and we're going to definitely get it out before the uh a spooky fall season that's headed our way so thanks so much stay safe out there and uh thank you again for subbing to the channel share it if you can I'm going to see if I can come up with some kind of really uh, nice giveaway, uh, maybe a little contest. And uh, just if you can get it out there and I'll reveal as we go along what that just might be. I'm trying to toss around some ideas. So thanks again, me and all of these <laughs> crazy characters in this story. Thank you so, so much for listening. <laughs>